Great song. I believe too. How about you? We talk about Christmas today, obviously. It's Christmas Eve. And Merry Christmas, by the way. Turn around there, at least beside you, and say Merry Christmas to the person beside you around it. I never get enough of Christmas season. I don't know about you. But Christmas, in the context of all things, is definitely good news. Amen. And uh, I have a passage I want to share with you out of Isaiah 52 in just a moment. But before I get to there, I want to kind of give you a, a little background uh, to where we're at. You can go to the title slide there if you don't mind. And, uh, but in Isaiah 52, the title slide is the one before that, I believe. <laughs> well, don't read it ahead of me because I've got to set this up. This is written 2,500 years before Christmas night happened. It's 2,500 years. It's a message that comes of good news. And it was given to a people who were not necessarily experiencing the good news. It was given to a people who were living in shambles at the time. The nation of Israel was in devastation. It had been destroyed and overrun by the Babylonians who'd carried away many of the great leaders, people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had all been carried away from Jerusalem to live in Babylon and to grow up there. It, had been a, it was a time of hopelessness and a time of despair. The people, you cut my mic down a little bit, it's really ringing up here. The people were brokenhearted. The city of Jerusalem, which had been the incredible, beautiful city that was the capital of the nation, was in ruins. The temple that Solomon had built in all its beauty was in shambles. Big brazen altar that set out in front of the temple was destroyed. The temple lay in ruins itself. All the majesty was gone. The greatest of the leaders had been carried, away, as I said, away into Babylonian captivity. And it's in that kind of backdrop and in that kind of scenario that the, Isaiah the prophet is preaching a message of redemption and a message of salvation and a message of hope and peace to the people of Israel. I don't, I don't know. I can't imagine having lived in that time just how difficult it would be to know that maybe the people I loved, part of my family, had been carried off into captivity. And then to hear the prophet ring out with, with these words from Isaiah 52. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, who publish peace, who bring good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns, the voice of your watchmen. They lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Verse 9 says, bring forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Verse 10, the Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. What a message of hope and what a message of redemption that comes from, these, from the lips of Isaiah. It's a message of deliverance. It's a message that this, it's literally the same message that comes at a time of great despair to the nations the night that Jesus Christ is born when the angels break forth into singing to the shepherds or they deliver the message prior to that to Mary in Jerusalem. It's all a message of good news. It's all a message of glad tidings. It's all a message of hope. I know that there's been a lot of Christmas songs that are written that says Christmas is, and then it goes on and it talks about snowflakes and bells and those kind of things. I, I think it was Percy Faith who once wrote his maybe not so familiar holiday song entitled Christmas Is. He's trying to capture some of the things, to him at least, that Christmas entails and that make up Christmas. He, he talks about sights and sounds and feelings and what Christmas is and how it's sleigh bells and snowflakes. But I want you to know those things may evoke some nice feelings of the Christmas season. But Christmas is more than snowflakes and sleigh bells and trees and lighted streets. It's all about the grace of God, and it's all about that message of Isaiah 52. If you can go back to verse 7 for me again. Verse 7, it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, who publish peace, bringing news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. That's the same message that today, this night, a Savior is born. He'll redeem the people. He'll save them from their sins. And they go and they run to the manger to see the Lord Jesus Christ in swaddling clothes. When you think about that first message of Isaiah that he shares with the people, your God reigns, they certainly don't see it anywhere. I mean, they're living in bondage and they're living in captivity. 
I really believe that even as that message sounds for today, people don't see it a lot as well. They're not really hearing the message of peace and hope and glad tidings and good news and this message of your God reigns. That's not what, what they're hearing. In fact, it's, it's all just a, a different thing. In the day that Isaiah writes this, there's two things. It was one, for people who have nothing, and secondarily, it was for people who need everything. Here were a people in captivity, in ruins, in despair. They needed everything. They had nothing. There was nothing that would meet their needs. I still believe the message that God gives us today is for people who have nothing and also for people who need everything. As he addressed those ragtag group of people in what was once the capital of Israel, the beauty of Zion is gone, it's a message of hope. But can you imagine today the people who hear this message of Christmas? who are living in desperation, who realize in their own heart that they really have nothing and that they absolutely need everything. This is a message of glad tidings, he said. It's a message of good hope. And here's the beautiful thing about it all. Whether it was then or whether it's now, we need to understand, as they needed to understand, that God is faithful. God is sovereign. And God is going to accomplish what he set forth to accomplish. He tells the people that Jerusalem's going to be restored. And ultimately, it is restored. In fact, it has lost its beauty then, and now it's restored again. God is faithful. Just as it was in ruins due to the Babylonian invasion, by the way, 2,500 years ago, he comes to them and says, your God reigns. We're going to rebuild. We're going to restore. And deliverance and salvation is coming. Hey, the Lord says today, there's coming a new kingdom, and there's coming a new hope, and there's coming a, a, a salvation that will save all men. And yet, as we say, perhaps the world doesn't see it. They were a people who needed everything, had nothing. Folks, I don't know if you see it or not, but if we were to be able to kind of look at the spiritual condition of our lives, minus what we think, you know, is what makes life happen, but the truth of the matter, that real life comes from God and that He is the creator of us all, and He created us for a purpose, and that purpose for you and I to know Him. If we don't have a relationship with Him, we need everything. And we have nothing. Until you know Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you really don't possess anything. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that life more abundantly. Salvation is what that is, folks. It's rebirth is what that is. It's Christ Jesus coming into the hearts of all people who are willing to open their heart and their life to him. The beginning of the message for us is obviously Christmas. Christ come. He's born in a, in a lowly stable. But the same Christ who's come is also the same Jesus who will live this perfect sinless life, who will ultimately go to Calvary and give up his life for our sins there, be raised from the dead in all his glory. We're going to see again that our God reigns. It was in the sovereignty of God to destroy the Babylonians shortly after this message was given. Can you imagine as Isaiah prophesies this, and then the people in Jerusalem hear that Babylon has fallen, many of those people who were exiled will be coming home. Mom's coming home. Dad's coming home. Family's going to be united. Life is going to come back to the, to the nation of Israel. Folks, I want you to know there's this d doomed place in this world that we don't often look at, nor do we want to look at, that realizes in that place that sin is a reality. And that when sin entered the world through Adam and Eve's disobedience to God, that it passed upon all men, and that all men became sinners. But at Christmas, just as it was 2,500 years ago to the nation of Israel, there's this message of glad tidings that God is still on the throne, and he's going to send salvation, and he's going to send deliverance, and he's going to send hope. And in Christmas, he does that. In reality, yes, we are a people who have nothing, and we're a people who need everything. We stand before God. One day we're going to see just how wicked and how separated and how awful our, the damage was that was done to our lives as a result of willful disobedience to God, as a result of sin. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, the complete wholesome peace that man was to have known was now gone, and the perfect peace was gone. The hope that they had was diminished and gone. Today, people are still looking for heaven in this life, but it ultimately only comes to that relationship that you're going to experience in Jesus Christ. Some of you, the majority of you in this room, probably well aware of what I'm talking about. There was a time in your life you realized just how terrible and how deep the, the depth of sin was in your heart, and you realized that no matter what you do or could do, no matter how religious you tried to be, 
no matter how moral you try to pretend to be, that without Christ there's no hope, that we need a Savior. We need someone to forgive us of this deep, dark sin, this stain upon our soul, and to make us clean and to wash us clean. It's in those times when we get that kind of honest look at ourselves, we realize, and we're willing to be honest at least for the moment, that this is the God of grace, and this is the God of hope, and this is the God of salvation, and He's offering us life that we don't deserve. I know we're living in a culture that thinks that we deserve everything, but we really don't, due to sin and our rejection of God, we don't deserve even the little blessings that God gives us. We don't deserve our homes. We don't deserve our families or even our livelihood. Folks, we don't even deserve this beautiful church, this blessed fellowship. We don't deserve God's message of hope. But isn't that the beauty of Christmas? In spite of us not deserving it, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, now, people try to go through this season and, 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 and to, too often just reject the message of what it's all about, and they decorate their lives with tinsel and lights and trees and presents under the tree, and there perhaps is some sort of temporary pleasure in all of that, but it gives no lasting satisfaction. Our sinful hearts may think it's enough to hear the Christmas carols, to listen to them on the radio or to go to church on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve and have our Christmas dinner and eat our Christmas cookies. Amen? Maybe even peck somebody on the cheek or lips under the mistletoe. <laughs> but that's not enough. Those things can't bring the peace of God that He offers to us at Christmas. And isn't it interesting that doctors and psychologists and sociologists and psychiatrists tell us that more people commit suicide during this time of year than any other time of year. Isn't it interesting that most people during this season are not filled with great hope of joy? They experience in loneliness and despair and depression and hopelessness in their life. We are a people who have nothing and need everything. But yet, we in our culture today, we think that we're a people who have, you know, we, we don't need anything. But at the same time, we want everything. <laughs> we think we don't need anything at all. But at the same time, we're buying presents for each other, have no needs whatsoever for those physical material things for the most part. We just miss it all. We are people who need God, and we're people who need everything from God. Last week I preached on the, the name of Jesus, and it means that God is our Savior, God is our Deliverer, because that's the message of Christmas itself. Christmas is God bringing His deliverance and God bringing His salvation to us and God restoring us to a right relationship with Him all through the precious gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, born in a manger, ultimately dying on a cross, being raised from the dead on our behalf. That verse 10 there, I don't know if this thing's working or not, but verse 10 says, the Lord, I love this verse, will lay bare His holy arm in the sight of all the nations and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Now, some of you guys that perhaps might work out, one or two of you, might understand laying bare your, your arm. Got to show our muscles, you know. Got to strut the guns. Show how strong we are. And we show and bare our arms in might or in defiance or in victory or whatever it might be. But the Lord laid bare His holy arm, and His name is Jesus Christ. I don't know when I first saw this verse as a young Christian, I think what, I, what came to my mind was Popeye. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't even still have Popeye around for this next culture. It's the next generation, I don't even know who Popeye is. Popeye the sailor man. <laughs> Popeye the sailor man, uh, poor guy, he had a rough life. And in this cartoon character of Popeye, there was it Bluto or Bruno or whatever his name was. Pluto. Who? Okay, whatever it is. Yeah, so I, I'm not deep on the theology of Popeye, okay? <laughs> Bear with me. But he was a brute, and he was a beast, and he always picked on everybody and tried to steal olive oil, Popeye's love away from him. When everything got very bad and difficult, Popeye would reach for the can of spinach. I never bought into that, by the way, so I hate spinach. And he'd pop it open, and he'd dump the spinach down his throat and swallow it, and all of a sudden, his guns would pop out, you know? Boom, boom, the muscles would explode. You see his anchor because he was the sailor man, you know. He had the anchor tattoo, and man, they'd pound out, and the other one of a tank would explode or something, you know. Had, the guns would be laid bare, and he'd go to work. Well, that's 
you know, you can do away with the cartoon characters and you can get rid of the superheroes because our Lord has unwrapped His glorious might by allowing Himself ultimately wrapped up in a small child in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And the Savior Himself took on this human flesh and then He revealed His splendor and His glory by living the perfect life, dying in our place on the cross, being raised by the power and the glory of God, and now sets at the right hand of all authority and all majesty and power. The Lord has laid bare His holy arm, and He's shown us Jesus Christ. I mean, we have the glad tidings of Christmas. We have the glad tidings we've sung this morning, the glad tidings of the angels. Every time we hear this Christmas song or the Christmas message, it is good news. Even in Scriptures, it's always announced as good news, glad tidings, peace, blessings, grace from God. Whether it's Bethlehem, whether it's Calvary, whether it's the resurrection, it's certainly more than holly and tinsel and sparkling snow and children's laughter. Christmas is not for the people who want everything and need nothing. Christmas is for the people who need everything and have nothing and whatsoever. Christmas is for you because the Lord has laid bare his holy arm. I shared with my staff, I guess it was Monday when our staff meeting, a little, I have a devotional book. It's many years old, and so uh, some of the stories in it date back in time really far. In fact, I shared with them one of those stories from the devotional book I'd read that morning had to do with Prince Edward, who was a young prince in Great Britain back in 1934. Uh, the following was, was, was published in a British magazine, and it talked about how the young Prince Edward, who was heir to the throne, was visiting a, a small hospital where 36 hopelessly injured and disfigured veterans of the First World War were being tended to. The story went on to talk about how Prince Edward stopped at each cot and spoke with each veteran and shook their hands and tried to encourage them and thank them for their service to their country. And when he finished, it was, he was exited, taken to the exit of the door to which he said, hold on, I was told that I was here to visit 36 uh, patients. Yes, sir, you are. He said, well, by my count, I've only seen 29. The head nurse took a moment to say, well, the other seven, sir, was so shockingly disfigured that for the sake of your royal feelings, basically, you haven't been taken to see those other seven. The young prince insisted he had to see them. He wanted to thank them for their sacrifices, more so them than the others. And he went, and he stood by the bed of each of these soldiers that were remaining one, two, three, four, five, six, thanking them all. And they're getting ready to exit him out, to, to take him to the exits again. He says, excuse me, <laughs> that's just six. I, there's, there's one more man that I haven't seen. Where's the seventh? To which the head nurse informed him that no one is really allowed to go in there to see him. She explained he's blind. He's extremely maimed and dismembered. He's horribly disfigured. It's the worst situation of all. We've isolated him to this room by himself because of his condition, and it's a room he'll probably never leave. She said, please don't ask to see him. Well, he couldn't be daunted in his efforts. And they showed him, took him to this darkened room. The young prince went into the room, and he looked down at this man. It's what was left of this man's physical life. And the article says, there with white face and drawn lips, looking down at what had once been a fine man but was now just a horror, the tears broke out. And with a lovely impulse, the, imp the young prince bent down and reverently kissed the cheeks of this broken hero. Now, to me, that's such a moving story of greatness and appreciation and love for someone who sacrificed so much. But there is still a finer more glorious story than that that you need to remember. There is one who stooped far, far lower to kiss a far, far worse ugliness than that which war had brought on. Not a physical disfigurement of a broken hero whose brokenness, by the way, would call forth reverent gratitude for the service he had rendered. But this prince, our Savior, the Lord Jesus, bends down to kiss the cheek of a far worse leprous ugliness of corrupt sinners, people who had rebelled against him and his Father and against all the infinite love God had manifest. Jesus Christ comes at Christmas and becomes a man so that he can mend our lives, 
ultimately taking him to Calvary, which is by far the greatest picture of compassion. And there he lays upon us a redeeming kiss that heals our sinful hearts. The Bible says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And this is worthy of all acceptation. What does that mean? That means it is the greatest statement that cannot be refuted, and it needs to be stated over and over again. Friends, you, you may receive the, some great gifts this Christmas, but the greatest gift you will ever receive is the gift of Jesus and the gift of life. And that life is for here. It's a gift of forgiveness for now. It's a gift of redemption to take away the scar, the sin, the stain. They bring a healing to your life. It's a story of life. It's a story of light. Christmas, although it may take place in our minds in a dark stable, is brilliant light breaking forth into the darkness to bring about God's grace and about His compassion. It's a story of revelation. This point of our service, what we want to do today is you've been given a candle. 